Pal Mal Famous Cigarettes present The Big Story. Okay, that's Moose. Now, you all know what to do. Let him in. Hiya! Hiya, Joey! Sit down. What's the matter? Hey, put that gun down, Joey. What's the matter, huh? Nothing. Not a thing. Just ratted. You just went and sang to the cops. I didn't! Shut up. Shut up and start to die. Because here it comes. Oh, don't, Joey, don't! <laughs> <laughs> just a gag, Moose. It wasn't loaded. I was getting bored, so I thought I'd have a laugh. Okay, now let's get to work. I got a nice job. All lined up. The Big Story. Another in the thrilling series based on true experiences of newspaper reporters. Tonight, to Ted Prager of the New York Daily News, goes the Pell Mell Award for The Big Story. <laughs> Four notes that are alike, and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package, Pell Mell. Ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed how many of your friends have changed to Pell Mell? There's a reason. Pell Mell famous cigarettes... Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, there's one cigarette that's really different. Really outstanding, Pell For Pell Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke of this longer, finer cigarette. Gives you that smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Four notes that are alike and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes, outstanding. And they are mild. Now the authentic and exciting story of Manhunt in Manhattan. You are Ted Prager, night reporter for the New York Daily News. And murder is almost old hat to you. You've covered the doings of Vincent, Mad Dog, Carl, Dutch, Schultz, Sony Madden, and Murder Incorporated for your paper. You know your underworld, you know robbery, arson, burglary, and homicide. Almost inside out, the way an insurance man knows statistics. Yes, you know your business. You're even a little blasé about crime. Until one night, about one in the morning, you're in a friendly bar on East 7th Street, and the conversation is small talk with Sandy, the bartender. Oh, football's not football anymore. You're too professional, Sandy. Give me those college teams. Yeah, I agree with you, Mr. Prager. You take that old Notre Dame team, I'd rather watch them than it. Hey, Mr. Prager, you see that? What? That guy just walked in. The one with his hair all slicked down? Yeah. Looks like there's four or five with him. And... Say, I know that face from somewhere. Some small-time mug or other. What are they spreading out like that for? I don't know. Sandy, it looks like a stick-up. <laughs> There's a smart man. Cute, too. Give that man a cigar. That's just what it is. All right, everybody, quiet. And you people haven't figured it out yet. This is what we call a hold-up. Get your wallets out, rings, jewelry from the ladies. My boys will pass among you. Baki, you. Me? Open up that register and empty it on a bar. Now, make the rounds, boys. And you don't have to leave none of these good people car fare. Let them walk. <laughs> what are you looking at, cute guy? Nothing? I see what you got. Here's my money. Yeah. $40. I'll take your pen, too, and your wallet and that ring. Okay. 
What do you think you're looking at? My face? Don't you like what you see? Maybe you want to remember me, is that it? Here. Moose. Yeah? Give me a blackjack. This cute fella here is giving me the once-over. Chief, we're all set. We got everything cleaned it out good. Let's go. Okay, we go. Too bad, cute guy. And I was just going to give you something to remember me by. So long, dopes. Then something incredible happens. Five crooks walked in, but only three leave. Two of them are still standing in the bar, looking bewildered not knowing what to do. Then you realize that they're not armed. Maybe you can stop them. You move and pandemonium breaks loose. Hey! 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 Here comes the cop! Get him! All right, stand back there! You two, stop, all right? Okay! Hey! The cop got him both! Good shooting there, officer. Thanks. Well, you couldn't get them all, but at least you got two of them. Yeah. Hey, dead officer? I don't think so. Hey, who are you? You look familiar. Ted Prager of the news. Oh, yeah, sure. I remember you, Mr. Prager. Excuse me, I got to call the ambulance. Nice work, officer. I'd like to write you up. What's your name? Matt Gaines, 22nd Precinct. I could use the story, Mr. Prager. You could say it's too bad I only got two of them. <laughs> too bad I only got two of them. Ain't that the funniest thing you ever heard? Oh, that's terrific, uh, Joey. <laughs> listen, when Joey Rice does it, it gets done. Yeah. Too bad I only got two of them, said the policeman. Listen, from the paper, get this. It was not until after the shooting that the officer discovered his fatal mistake. <laughs> the two men who had entered the bar with the gang were not part of the mob. I like that, not part of the mob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead, finish it, Joey. Yeah, hold your horses, not part of the mob. Instead, they were two innocent taxi drivers that the leader of the mob had forced to stay behind to act as shields so that the actual robbers might escape under cover of the violence directed against the taxi drivers. <laughs> Boy, is that the payoff. Yeah, those dopes stand in there. You know, I can just see them. Jeez. <laughs> Imagine what they'd done. They start beating up those taxi drivers and a cop comes and bang, bang. Law and order lays them out cold and says... Too bad I only got two of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They dead, Joey? No, no, no. Only one. Here, listen. One of the drivers, George Beaver, age 51, died instantly. The other, Edgar Benedetto, 34, is in city hospital, where his condition is listed as critical. <laughs> Boy, I ask you, ain't that the best scream you ever heard? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sit down, Gaines. Why don't you sit down? If he dies, Mr. Prager, I'd... I don't know what I'll do. Now, why blame yourself? You, you made a mistake any cop might have. A mistake? That's right. Anyone could have done it. No one blames you. I killed a man, an innocent man, and there's another one inside there in the operating room, and he may die, too. I murdered two men. You didn't murder anyone. You accidentally shot two men in the line of duty. Look, I saw the face of the man who really murdered Beaver, the leader of that gang. It was a cruel face and a vicious one. He's the murderer, if anyone is. I tell you, if Benedetto dies, Mr. Gaines, Plager, I'll I... make you a promise. I'll find that man. I know his face from somewhere. I don't care how long it takes or what I have to do, but I'll find him. That man, Benedetto, in the operating room, I, I checked up on him. He's 34. Been driving a cab since he was 21. Got a wife and two kids, a girl, seven, and a little baby, 21 months. I killed their father. I made a widow out of his wife. Stop it, Gaines. You've got to stop it. In the first place, Benedetto's not dead. No, only one of them's dead. Only Beaver's dead. Only a 51-year-old man's dead. That's not so bad, is Why it? Why do you torture yourself? Yeah, maybe I ought to just go outside. Sit and... down and just wait, Matt. Try it. Maybe it won't be so bad. Yes? What is it, Doctor? I'm sorry, gentlemen. Mr. Benedetto died on the operating table.
Gaines, are these all the pictures in your rogues gallery? That's right, Mr. Prager. Well, let's get started. That batch there will do. I'll know that face when I see it. You turn him, Gaines. I'll call if I see anything. All right. Uh huh. Nope. Nope, it's none of those. Let's see some more. You aren't going to find him. Keep going, Gaines. Just keep going. Nope. Uh-uh. What did you do that for? Why'd you throw him down? Oh, what's the use? We won't find him. What's the use of anything? Look, I told you before, you've got to get that crazy idea out of your head that you're responsible for the death of those drivers. I killed them, didn't I? Gaines, try to listen to me. I'm going after the man who led that holdup, the man who's really responsible for the death of those drivers. Well, that's going to be dangerous, Mr. Prager. If it gets around you're hunting a crook, you'll lose all your contacts. You won't be able to get the inside on anything. I'll take that chance. I can take care of myself. You won't even be able to get a byline on these stories. You won't dare let anyone know who's doing the job. That's not the most important thing in the world. And you get too close to this guy, there's no telling what might happen to you. I can still take care of myself. Now pick up those pictures and let's finish looking at them. And get rid of the idea you killed anyone. Yeah, okay, sure. I'll just forget the whole thing. Like it never happened. Only what do I do when I see a kid on the street and he reminds me of Benedetto's kids? What do I do at night to make me forget so I can go to sleep? Tell me that. And you, Ted Prager of the Daily News, you look at his eyes as he says these words, and you realize that this is a lot more than a story for your paper, important as that is. Yes, you want to help catch that crook with the patent leather hair and the steely eyes, but a man's sanity is at stake as well. The sanity of a nice Irish patrolman named Matt Gaines. That's also at stake. And you watch his big, open face as he listlessly turns the pictures in front of him. And you know you've got a job on your hands. A big one. We'll be back in just a moment with tonight's big story, but first a word from Cy Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed how many of your friends have changed to Pell-Mell? There's a reason. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes... Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, there's one cigarette that's really different, really outstanding. Pell-Mell. When you pick up a Pell-Mell, you can see the difference, you can feel the difference... And when you smoke a Pell-Mell, you can taste the difference. For Pell-Mell's greater length of traditionally fine, mellow tobaccos filters the smoke of this longer, finer cigarette. Gives you that smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Four notes that are alike. And one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell Mell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. <laughs> Turn you to our narrator, Bob Sloan, and tonight's big story. You, Ted Prager, night reporter for the New York Daily News, get moving on your search for a smooth haired bandit who held up a bar and caused the accidental death of two taxi drivers. And though you know what you're doing is dangerous, it may cost you your job, or maybe even your life, and even if you get anything, you won't be able to write it with your byline. You start making the rounds. You start combing through those smoke-filled bars where crimes are hatched and dips meet to talk over their successes. And you know what she did? She went right up to him and scratched her initials in his cheek. (laughs) What did he do to her, May? Tell him that. Ah, drink your beer. (laughs) Pull it, May. What do you want, bud? Nothing. Just looking? Well, we don't allow looking in here. Scram. Hello, Matt. Ted calling. No, nothing yet. Don't give up, fella. I've only been to about a dozen places. 
I'll find him. Beer, please. Right, one beer. Ah, he never should have done it. Using a couple of taxi drivers for shills. Uh, Why not, Mexie? Because it makes it tough for us. They doubled the cops in this area. They're watching every minute of the day. For him, yeah. But meantime, it makes it tough on us. Oh, never thought of that. Well, I did. Ask Millie here about him. She was there when it happened. Right in the place? No kidding? That's right. Right in the place when he walked in. The bar on East 7th. Did he take you for anything? Got $20 out of my bag. And a ring that Maxie gave me. Worth $80. No kidding. Sure. And he didn't have to do that with the drivers. I tell you, I'd like to make it hot for that wise guy. I'd like to sing a little tune hey, shut I... up. You won't sing no tune for anybody. Can't you see there's people around? Hi. I'm, uh, interested in what you said there, Millie. I don't know you. I didn't say a word. Uh, beat it. Look, uh, if you want to make a little money... I said to beat it. Okay. Okay. Only if you change your mind, my name is Ted Prager. There's people around who can tell you where to find me. You don't exist. <laughs> well, boys, like I always say... Another day, another eight grand. <laughs> oh, Joey, you're really in there. Huh? Yeah. We've been quiet now a month. I think it's time we stop being quiet. I even hear people stop talking about me. A job I pulled with the taxi drivers. So? What's a caper, Joey? You like this one, Moose? You like this special because this one is more my style. Listen. Prager speaking. Ted, this is Benson on the city desk. Can you go down to East Side Hall? Sure, what's up? Just got word for a, about a big holdup. Some girl was being confirmed. Big party and all that. Three men did the job. Who can I see? You can see the girl herself. She was only a kid, too. Fourteen. Right. Give me the address. I'm on my way. He came in, Mr. Prager, and they just took everything. I see. Uh, what did the leader of the gang look like? Oh, he was terrible. He had his hair all smoothed down and oily and a smile on his face. Uh-huh. Did he, uh, did he laugh? Out loud, I mean? Yes, sir. Especially when he... when he came after me. What'd he do to you? Well, I had my ring. My father just gave it to me for my confirmation. It was a ring with diamonds, Mr. Prager, so I... well, to keep him from getting it, I put it in my mouth. Yes? Well, he came up to me with that smile on his face, and he... he put his thumb on one side of my cheek and his fingers on the other. And, Why, that... And, he squeezed until I couldn't stand it anymore. <laughs> He's back. He's always back on the job. Don't you worry. I'll find that man. <laughs> can't park that car here, mister. Matt. Matt. Oh, it's you. I've been driving around looking for you. Can you get in? What for? He's back at it again. The guy we're looking for. He's around town. Can you come with me? Well, yeah, I'm off duty, but what for? Because I'm going hunting for him. For that patent leather hair and the smile. I want company. Hop in. i 
driving around three hours. Where do you expect to find this crook? Just standing on a corner? Maybe. You never can tell he might... Matt. What's the matter? Right there. Where? On the corner. Wouldn't he be right on the corner of Essex and Hester in broad daylight? That one? The one talking to the girl as if he didn't have a care in the world. You mean it, Ted? Take him, Matt. He's yours. Oh, brother, will I take him? Ted, I... I just saw Mr. Dennis. The prosecuting attorney? Yep. He says he needs a positive witness. Our friend denies everything? Of course. Never was in the 7th Street bar. Never held up anybody. Used taxi drivers as shields. What, him? Joey Rice do a thing like that? Oh, so that's his name, Joey Rice. Slick as they come. Smooth. It'll be tough to pin it on him. Okay, Matt. I'll go in and see Mr. Dennis. Oh, no. You can't identify Rice. Why not? Because it would finish you as a police reporter. Cut off all your contacts. And that's not all it might cut off. I'll take a chance. No, no, Ted, don't. I'll tell you what I'll do. Get Rice before me on a one-way screen. I'll identify him. Then let Mr. Dennis prepare his case. If he needs me in court, I'll testify. Now you're talking sense. So are you, Matt. All right, Rice. That way. Walk that way. What is this? Just a little matter of identification, Rice. As prosecuting attorney, I thought it might be a good idea to identify you. Get over to those chalk marks now and just stand still. Light on him okay for you, Mr. Brigger? That's fine, Mr. Dennis. Well? That's the man held up the 7th Street bar. You sure? Yes, Mr. Dennis. I'm absolutely sure. Okay, Sergeant, take him away. Thanks for the identification. I needed that. Next time you see him, he'll be in court. On trial for robbery and criminal assault. Look at him. Look at Joe Rice smiling, Matt. Yeah, but what are we going to do? I don't know. Maybe Mr. Dennis has an idea. He looks plenty worried. Oh, here comes the judge. Hear ye, hear ye, the Honorable Judge Bernard Smith presiding. Court is in session. There goes Dennis. Your Honor. Mr. Dennis, yes? Your Honor, as prosecuting attorney, I must protest the appearance of the defendant. If it please the court, it is obvious that the reason the defendant, Joseph Rice, came into this courtroom today wearing a full beard is to make absolute identification of himself impossible. Your Honor. We allege the defendant committed the crimes he's charged with, with a clean-shaven face. And consequently, he must, in the interest of justice and equity, be ordered to shave off the beard he has grown, which is a patent dodge and a ruse. Your Honor! Your Honor! The attorney for the defendant. Your Honor, my client, Joseph Rice, likes to wear a beard. He thinks a beard becomes him. And I say that every man has the constitutional right, if not the God-given right, to shave or not to shave, to wear a beard or not to wear a beard. Order, please, order. This is a very complicated question, gentlemen. We'll have to rule on that. Court is adjourned. <laughs> Never been decided before. It could go against us and we'd be licked before we start. He can't be ordered to shave, Mr. Dennis. It's never been decided before, Prager. What are we going to do, sir? I wish I had an idea, Gaines. Mr. Prager. Millie. Can I talk to you a minute? Why, sure. Mister, I, I seen what happened, what he pulled. I'd like to get up on that stand. You would, Millie? It'd be a pleasure, mister. Can you positively identify Joey, even with his beard, as the man who held up the 7th Street bar? I could do it if he was standing upside down. Okay, Millie. 
prosecuting attorney's right over there, but uh, what changed your mind? That little trick he pulled on the girl being confirmed, remember? Sure, I remember. Well, that little girl is my kid cousin. <laughs> And she testifies that beard or no beard, it was Joey Rice who held up that bar. You look over at Patrolman Matt Gaines as the trial winds up, and for the first time in months, the man's smiling. He's a human being again. And you've got your big story. Yes, but nobody knows it. Nobody knows it until now, this very night on a radio program called The Big Story. Not until now can you say, well, this is the job I did. This is the role I played. Ted Prager, night reporter of the New York Daily News. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Ted Prager of the New York Daily News with the final outcome of tonight's big story. The cigarette that's really different. The longer, finer cigarette that's really outstanding. Pell Mell Famous Cigarette. Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, Pell-Mells are good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. Four notes that are alike, and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from Ted Prager of the New York Daily News. Hold up man in tonight's big story was quickly convicted by jury. But while awaiting sentence, he became violent and was officially declared to be insane. He was therefore transferred to the asylum at Matawan, where he is still confined. Many thanks for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Prager. The makers of Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes are proud to have named you the winner of the Pell-Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes will present another big story, a big story from the pages of the Pittsburgh Press, byline William A. White. A big story that began when a taxi meter ticked off moments of waiting... For a man who didn't return. The Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor and directed by Harry Ingram with music by Vladimir Selinsky. Tonight's program was written by Arnold Pearl. Your narrator was Bob Sloan and William Quinn played the part of Ted Prager. All names in tonight's story except that of Mr. Prager were fictitious but the dramatization was based on a true and authentic case. This is Ernest Chappell speaking for the makers of Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.